All right, welcome you out again this morning in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and trust you were greeted heartily when you came in today. Also, there's a flap on your bulletin. Hopefully, you received the bulletin. And if you could fill that out if you're visiting us for the first time so we'd have a record of your visit, we'd appreciate that. All right, our annual missions conference will be the end of this month, the 29th, the 30th, and the 1st of October. And there's a list of missionaries. One that will not be here is Diana Quow. She is having some kidney issues. And she is in this country right now. And so I guess she's, she's getting medical attention here because she's in West Ghana is where her ministry's at. And so she will not, the way it looks, she's not going to be able to be here with us for the conference. We do have Dave and Patty Mason who are in Jacksonville, North Carolina with the missions to the military. And John and Linda Heater who are with the uh, medical team's missions who goes down to basically Jamaica, the islands down there, and offers uh, medical help to the people and therefore they can share the gospel with them. Phil and Lori O'Day, who are in Texas, and they train missionaries to go in Central and South America, Spanish-speaking areas. That's where they worked a good part of their life, and they're from this church. They're going to be with us. And also Pat Lackey, who's with Child Evangelism. So mark that on your calendars. Try to be here. It's a Friday night, all day Saturday, and Sunday morning for our missions conference. So that way you'll get to know them if you don't already and you'll get to know more effectively how to pray for them through the coming year and where they need support. All right, so there's sign-up sheets in the back for the different activities for the missions conference. So if you can be part of those, that would be great. So you can look them over to men's breakfast, the ladies' brunch, the Saturday afternoon meal, and then again Sunday we'll have a, a little set out after, uh, after the services with our missionaries. Also make note these annual reports, which we all love to do, and they'll be here, have to be here by October the 6th for our annual meeting, November the 12th. So Adriana will be very appreciative to get those ahead of time. It takes a while to make this little report, annual business meeting report up that we receive each year. Also, if there's any budget considerations, Todd has deep pockets and he will make sure that they are, no, no, it doesn't say that says please bring it to the office or see Todd he's not funding it he's just observing it and recommending it to the board so that's any considerations if you say hey, we need some money for this or that um, let us know there's also a nomination form in the bulletin today if you'd like to nominate someone for a position and uh, feel as though that they meet the qualifications in uh, Timothy uh, do so and then the board will review that and let's see, also faith promise cards. We've been doing those for a number of years and it's more like pledge cards. And what we do is we ask the congregation if what they think God is leading them to give for the coming year towards missions. That way we can figure out a missions budget if we have to curtail some of it or if we can add to it, we will do that. So they're in the, in the uh, bulletins today and you don't put your name or anything on this. It's just Give us an amount so we'll know what we're working with. Um, let's see, I think that's it for the announcements. I will relinquish it to the next person. Who's up next? Oh, Lee's up next. Here he comes, see? All right, good morning, everyone. If you would uh, turn with me, we're going to be in John chapter 9. I'm going to be reading the first 10 verses. All right, John chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, with this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. And so he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is, this not, is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. 
But he said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? Right, and as you, uh, if you keep reading through the chapter, which Henry may go on to uh, talk about, uh, they were trying to trap him, seeing if he actually believed in Jesus, and if he did, they were gonna cast him out of the, uh, the synagogue there. And his parents also um, were asked about this, and they feared them, they didn't wanna be cast out, and they, they would not reply back to this. So let's pray and ask the Lord to continue to help us. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, for uh, giving us this morning and for helping us in all the things that are going on. Thank you for uh, the testimony of what you did. We know that you're above um, all things that uh, we think are impossible, and we thank you for the, the testimony of healing this uh, man who was blind since birth. And we thank you that uh, you continue to work in our hearts today. We pray that uh, you'd help everyone this morning, that you'd bless them, help them to grow closer in you, uh, and we thank you again for uh, being able to have the freedom to come and, and worship together in you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll get started. You know, God knows where each one of us are in our lives now, what's going on in our lives, um, what we need. And so as we go through his word today, I pray that uh, something that we're going to touch upon here may visit uh, an aspect of your life that uh, you may need help with or reinforce something that you're doing that's good. All right, so we're going to be looking in John chapter 9, as Lee read earlier. You know, the book of John is very interesting. It, it's a very good book for someone who is a new Christian, someone who's just come to faith in Christ. This is a good starting point for them to read this book. Um, it's not complicated. It's very straightforward, and it touches on all areas of our salvation and how it came to be. And you realize that 90% of the material that John writes about is not in the synoptic, the other three gospels. We call them synoptic because they say the same thing, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is different, however, and John was written at a later date as well. But 90% of what John writes, you're not gonna find in the other, in the other gospels. Same way with the, the, what we're gonna read today. And John sets out different premises in his writing um, one is the I am statements, you know, like I am the light of the world, I am the resurrection. Um, and he also sets out with seven uh, miracles. And one of the miracles that we talk, we're going to talk about today, but there's seven of them contained there. And each one as a reinforcement or a witness to somebody who's unsaved is what Jesus did. Um, John tells us at the end of his book, in the last chapter, that he could have wrote about a lot of miracles that Jesus performed, okay, that he eyewitnessed. But what's the sense of telling you of a thousand if you're not going to believe these seven? It just gets repetitive. And so he just says, takes these seven and puts them out there. God inspires him to put them out there. And these are the ones, you know, you should look at. They attest to who Jesus is. Um, John never refers to himself in his, in his writing here. He always refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. As you read through that book, you'll see that. He never says, you know, I, John, or like in uh, Revelation, he, he, he says, uh, I, John, was on, in the, uh, what was it? And forget the exact verbiage on that, but he was in the Lord's day when all this happened to him, this vision in Revelation. Um, now, he wants to show what? What is John's purpose in his gospel here? to show that Jesus is God, okay? That's very important, that Jesus is God. He's not a created being just like uh, the Mormons, for instance. He's like a brother of Lucifer, a spirit being. No, he is God. And a lot of your cults will disagree with you on this. You'll find that right away, and you want to meet them head on with this to start with so that you can prove your point. Now... In the first two verses, if you have your Bibles, just follow along because we're going to stay. Uh, I think I stayed mostly in the book of John here, so we don't have to jump back and forth through other books and passages. But he starts out in the first two verses that Jesus passed by and saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi or teacher, who sinned that this man or his parents that he was born blind? All right, so right from the very beginning... The disciples are with him, and they see the situation. This guy's born blind, and they're like, 
Huh, sin causes blindness. Is that what causes it? Sin causes birth defects. Is that what causes it? And so they asked them, did this man sin? You know, at some point did this man commit this grievous sin and he was struck with blindness? Um, we have accounts where different people in the Old Testament like were, were chastised by God and they had leprosy come upon them um, or they were struck blind, but they received their sight back. Eventually, some of them did. But this man has it. Another question they asked him, did his parents sin? What did they do? Parents must have done something. It's got to be a root cause to this man being born blind. And so the disciples question him. Now, being blind from birth is the reason for the questions from the disciples. Um, think about it, why they would ask him such questions as this. Well, it would come from teaching. You know, how were they taught as they grew up, as they went to the temple, as they went to their synagogue? How were they taught? So it's obvious they were taught that this blindness or infirmity was a re direct result of a sin. All right. Um, we look back, we talked about that earlier, about Job. You know, with Job's friends, <coughs> when they come to counsel him later on and he's in dire straits because of first his, what was his family gone, his, his uh, livestock, then his health. Remember, Satan goes back as his health. And so Job's three friends are saying, hey, you must have sinned. You did something wrong. You need, you need to confess what you did and get right with the Lord. Well, Job hadn't done anything. Same way with this man here. He hadn't done anything, but the disciples are under the impression that he or his parents sinned. So, if they're being taught this in the synagogue or in the temple, then they're being taught erroneously. And that's why we have to be so careful when we teach, when we teach here at the church, whether we're teaching children, just as important, or adults, as to what you're teaching. Is it lined up with what God's word says or is it lined up with something that man has concocted and said this is the result of this or that? All right. And so this is what's happened with these uh, disciples. I mean, they've been following Jesus closely, watching him do different things, watching him, listening to him, saying different things. And so they're postulating here that this man or his parents sin. So bad teaching leads to bad assumptions. If the leaders are in error... Your leadership is in error teaching. All right, guess what? Those who listen and follow, they're going to be in error also. It's like during the intertestament period, those 400 years, we call them silent years, um, all these laws that the Pharisees and the Sadducees came up with were not God ordained, they were man ordained. Okay, and so they're teaching them to the, to the Jewish people. And like if you can't, we see with a crippled man picking up his bed and walking, you can't walk with a bed on the Sabbath day. That's against the Sabbath law. They started adding all these external laws, which they couldn't keep. Jesus tells them, you couldn't keep them, and you thought them up. This is something you thought. God did not send this to you. All right, so if the leaders are in error, guess what? The people are going to be in error also. Jesus had come into the world to be light, and now he's going to shed light on this situation here. Now, he just left the predicament before this Jesus did, and they wanted to stone him. Okay? The religious leaders wanted to stone him. And so the disciples will, will talk about that in the time to come here. So the Jewish leaders wanted to stone him get him out of the way. He was a thorn in their side. He was, they looked at him as threatening their authority, which he was. And they wanted him gone. I mean, that's the easiest way to get rid of a person who's giving you trouble. Do away with them. And that's what they wanted to do with him. So this blind man sitting begging. What else could he do? He's been blind from birth. You know, can you imagine going through your entire life and never seeing a thing? Not witnessing anything. Never, you know, no light, no nothing. I mean, some people are called blind today, but they're not like 100% blind. This man was 100% blind, couldn't see his hand in front of his face. And so uh, what I've learned over the years in school was that your other senses that you have pick up, like your sense of hearing, your sense of smelling, tasting, all become more acute because of your compromised sight. You can't see, so your other senses kind of take over. And things that we would not pay any attention to normally if we were blind 
If someone comes in their room, you may say, oh, mm, that smells like Aunt Jane or something, you know. And you know them, and you didn't even see them. Or I heard them step the way they walk, and you pick up on that. So this man, again, has other senses about him, but as far as sight, it's gone. There used to be, years ago, in D.C., I used to, when I was a teenager, we used to, on Saturday, of course, we didn't have school. I was thankful for that. Um, but we would catch a bus out where I lived. I lived just two blocks out of the district in southeast and we would catch a bus and go downtown and we'd go around different buildings sometimes we'd go to museums you know on saturday and actually do profitable things lots of times and my dad was working down there like in the banks and stuff different times i'd go by and see him on a saturday where well, there was always this man on the corner i remember around 11th street on um, northwest and he was playing a guitar but he couldn't see he was blind and so he had this cup attached like to his guitar for people to drop coins in. And people would do this, you know, that's how, you know, back then you didn't have as many programs like you have today. Um, and that's how he would earn some money. He couldn't work. Although you had places like, uh, used to be, I guess you still have Columbia Lighthouse for the blind. They trained the blind people how to read braille, how to lead productive lives, how to work, hold a job. <laughs> but back then with this man Jesus is encountering here he didn't have any of that benefit so he was at the mercy of his friends to look after him I mean when he went to work there today somebody had to take him to sit on the corner and beg for alms he couldn't get there on his own um, but these are definite things that you'll encounter in life at some point and so there in amongst the Jews now and this man has been crossed by Jesus at this point um, so they always have to look for help somebody they're dependent on somebody else this is a severe handicap being blind um, I mean being paraplegic severe handicap too but this blindness is what we're focusing on today but you notice at the beginning here the disciples what are they focusing on they're focusing on the fact that why is he born blind they didn't ask Jesus, oh, you know, how can we help this guy? I find that a little strange, too, that they, they weren't thinking along that way, that they were thinking about, how did this happen? You know, not how we can help him. Um, do we do that today? If we see someone who's down and out, do we judge them already in our own heart when we see them? You know, ah, they must have done something crazy to get in this condition. You know, no, it's... Can we help them some way or another? Not to just do it on a whim, but to actually help them. I try to help people that's on intersections, and DC's famous for these people asking for change all the time. I mean, it's organized. And so some of the people, yeah, they're pretty, pretty dire straits. Well, I will give them something to eat, like I'll carry Slim Jims or something in my truck, and I'll offer them, then they'll take them. But I'm not going to give them money because a lot of them are into drugs or alcohol or whatever, and they're just going to go do that. And some of them will be honest with you up front and say, hey, if you give me money, that's what I'm going to go do with it. You'll find that. Not a lot, but you will find that. I remember uh, this lady one time come to me in a McDonald's parking lot, had a little baby with her, and was saying, hey, I need help, you know, we're hungry and stuff and all. And I said, okay. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, I'll take you and the baby inside and buy you all a meal. Oh, no, you don't have to do that. I don't want to put you out. I said, no, it's not putting me out a bit. She never did accept it. She wanted it for other purposes. And the baby may not have even been hers. It might have been a friend of hers or whatever, and she just had it for a prop. But we do have to be very aware of our situation, you know, when we get into places like this. So the disciples weren't interested in helping him out. They just wanted to discuss why he was in this condition. So back then, blindness, like was thought, of being a result of sin okay just like job and his three friends job lost everything because he was a sinner he had sinned not the case and not the case here now <coughs> with some uh with some uh, theories behind this man being born blind i'll give you a few that's thrown out um the jews believed some of the jews not all of them these are different forms of the jews in different areas. Some believe that um, 
a pre-existence of the soul. All right, so in this pre-existence of the soul, this person must have sinned. That's one, one school of thought. Um, reincarnation, you know, reincarnation. We know the Hindus are strongly steeped in that. Um, and so they're thinking this man came back and he sinned. A sin in the womb. A baby could sin in the womb. How in the world you could even think that could happen, I do not know. But that was a postulate back then. All right, that they could sin in the womb. And another one was being blinded for a sin that he would possibly commit someday. They caused this blindness came on because the Lord knew he was going to sin someday, so they blind. he was blinded. All right, of course, we know that these are not true. But these are things that were around at the time. That's why the disciples threw out the question, did he sin or did his parents sin? Now, Jesus responds to their thoughts here. Look at verses 3 through 5 here, John. And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sin, but the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of, God, of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, this phrase will be repeated. I know it's repeated when Lazarus is raised from the dead and talking about, you know, you have to work when it's day. And he uses this same phraseology then. Now, no sin here, uh, no sin here is cause. Drugs can cause birth defects, all right? No sin is involved here with this blind man, but, like, drugs could cause birth defects. Um, and the parents... Of this child who has these birth defects as a result of the mother being an alcoholic, all right, or a drug addict, you have a lot of that today, has detrimental effects on the fetus and the unborn child. And even though this child has not committed these things, the mother did, and it's passed down to them. That God will uh, will forgive the mother if she ever cries out and accepts Christ as their Savior. But the fact of the matter is that sin had already been committed and the ramifications of it goes on. It's not brought to a halt. The, th the child still suffers. Um, there's all kind of defects from uh, abuse of uh, drugs and alcohol that's in the world today. And so this is still there. It's not eradicated, all right? But the person who committed this sin the mother can be forgiven of that, but the child will still suffer the consequences. If you're, uh, if, uh, if you're a drug addict yourself and you can have all kinds of physical abnormalities be because of that, Christ will forgive you, yes, and your sins will be forgiven, but the physical effects on your body will continue. You still have the effects of what you have done. That carries on. But this is not the case with the blind man. His mother didn't sin. His father didn't sin. Um, so this is a birth defect. The parents did not sin. That's what I want you to see here. This is a birth defect that came upon this child. Now, um, let me see in my notes here I made here. Yeah, our fallen condition from Adam. Think about that. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden, remember they were created in a perfect environment. There wasn't no cancer. There wasn't any bacteria. Okay, none of this stuff existed. But once they fell in the garden, all this calamity became into the universe itself. And that's where all these things stem from. All right, and it carries on down to this day. Even after Noah and the flood, these effects still come today. And so <laughs> with this man being born blind, God had a specific reason for allowing this to come into his life. God didn't cause him to be born blind, but he allowed it to happen. And it's a result of the original sin. It's still, and it's still in effect today. It can still happen today. Um, so our fallen condition in Adam con contributes to these happenings. This was the plan of God here. God uses this situation to show others the Redeemer, who is his son. That's why this whole situation arose. Again, in John, he's laying out these seven miracles that Jesus performed so that others would come to Christ. And this is just one of them. Now, God did not deliberately cause this. He uses the results to glorify himself. 
And a blind man will eventually, as you, if we won't get that far into the story today, will glorify God too by having his sight restored to him. And Jesus, again, with this phrase that he uses, working in the day, light, okay, Jesus knows the brevity of life, the shortness of life. Jesus knows that. And he knows that he's only got X number of days to do these works in front of the Jews to convince them that, hey, I'm the Messiah, I'm the anointed one, I'm Christ, I'm God come in the flesh. And the night's coming when he's no longer going to be around. God, he's going to be crucified and die on the cross for our sins, and he'll be gone off the scene. The Holy Spirit will come as a result because he promised that, <coughs> but Jesus will be gone. And so he's working these works while it's daylight, while people can still see what's going on in front of their eyes. And the night's coming, he said, when no man can work. Over again, again, he says that. All right. He's letting them know whether they're comprehending this. It doesn't appear so right now at this time. But they will think back upon this, like when John inspired to write this, I'm sure he thought back, yeah, that's exactly what he was meaning in that situation, that he cannot be here with us forever. Now, the man is healed, all right? He didn't go to Jerusalem University Hospital, okay? He didn't have some hocus-pocus uh, person work this uh, miracle on him. He had God in the flesh work this miracle. And what hospital does he, what hospital did he use? None. What operating room did Jesus use? None. Okay. <coughs> was he in a, a sterile environment? Well, uh, with putting mud in his eyes, I wouldn't say that was a sterile environment. Um, no, he didn't do it that way. Okay. Very like, uh, what would you call, unorthodox way of doing this. Okay. Although uh, spittle is often used in the ancient world, okay, for different purposes. And everyone's watching this. Okay, everyone's seeing what's going on. So, he sends him, once he puts this, remember he makes this uh, eye salve up out of the, the dirt, and what were we created from? Oh, we were created from the earth, from the dirt. Isn't that remarkable? And he uses it here and anoints his eyes with it. Then he sends him away, he has to do something. <coughs> he sends him to this pool of Siloam, all right? And this pool, it's, the reason it's called Sent is because Hezekiah's tunnel was dug under Jerusalem to supply the city with water. And that's what this tunnel was called, called Sent, because the water is sent into the city. And so he tells him to go down there and to wash his eyes in this pool. How does he get there? Well, he calls the Uber driver, and he brings his chariot, and he takes him to the pool, right? No, his friends obviously didn't say the disciples did, but someone had to lead him there. Okay, and out of obedience, he didn't argue this point and say, man, this is the craziest thing I ever heard. He put this clay in my eyes and he's telling me to go wash and I'm going to see. We have other instances of, of, of like things. Remember the, uh, the little Israeli girl, the Jewish girl that was in captivity and she told Naaman to go to the prophet who was Elijah and he tells him to go to, what was it, the Jordan River? And to wash, and he said, yeah, I got water in my own country. I don't need to go there. No, this is the prescribed method that God wanted him to follow. Same way here with this blind man. He had a certain method to follow, and one of them was going to his pool. And so his friends grab him, or however, lead him. Okay, he's used to being led, right? No problem. And they go to this pool, all right? Now, this pool of Siloam, again, it means sent. It's Hezekiah's tunnel. And the water was set into the city. Now, something to think about here. John refers to Jesus as being sent. That's kind of a tie-in with this. John refers to Jesus as being sent. So the miracle is happening by the one who was sent. Jesus was sent. He's doing the miracle. He's known as the one who was sent. And he sends this blind man to this pool of Siloam. Now, someone had to show him the way, we said, for him to obey the Lord. Guess what? He comes back seeing. He's a changed man. Can you imagine being around at that time and, and to be a witness to this? I know, uh, I don't know how many of you have ever encountered people who are blind, totally blind. Uh, if you've ever seen pictures, sometimes their eyes are kind of withdrawn in their head. Have you ever seen, I think uh, one of them I've seen was, uh, I think it was Fanny Crosby. 
they had a picture of her, but hers was caused by um, maltreatment by a doctor. But they have a different appearance. A blind person has a different appearance. And so now he's got his sight, and he's going to go back around the people he was with. So keep in mind, he's probably going to look a little bit different than what he did before, because they're going to question him about this. Now, someone had to show him the way. He comes back a changed man. Now, in verses 8 through 12, we're going a little bit further than what uh, Lee read this morning. The neighbors, look at how the neighbors react in verses 8 through 12. Said, therefore, the neighbors, those who previously had seen that he was blind, said, is not this who he who sat and begged? And some said, this is he. Others said, he's like him. And he speaks, so he says, I am he. Therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes opened? And he answered and said, a man called Jesus made the clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. All right. So he hasn't seen Jesus face to face yet. <clears throat> he knows who he is because I'm, I'm sure those around him told him, you know, who's doing this. But he hasn't yet seen him. Remember, he was blind. So these neighbors are asking him, you know, are talking to him. And <clears throat> they said, this, this, he looks like the guy, but I don't know if he's him or not. You know, I don't know who his, what his name was. We're never told his name. Uh, and so they're asking him, they said, are you the one that was blind and now you see? How, how did all this happen? And he explains to them. So he's brought after this, you'll see that he's brought to the Pharisees. Aha, the religious leaders. They want to take him to them. And you know, when something like this occurred in a Jewish person's life and God healed them, they were supposed to go before the priest <coughs> and make an offering for the healing that they had received. Now, that's, not, I don't, that's not mentioned in this story. But the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they're going to want to know, hey, how did this happen? Who did this? So he's brought to, the, to celebrate the miracle. No, he's not brought to the Pharisees to celebrate the miracle at all. So a law was broken. That's what they're focusing on. What's the law? Well, he got healed on the Sabbath. He actually went to that pool and washed his eyes on the Sabbath. Oh, no. You know, how could he do that? One of their external laws that they came up with, he's uh, breaking the traditions of man. Now, traditions are not always harmful, but lots of times they are. And in this case, they definitely were because they're adhering to what man has come up with and not God. And so there's no praise to the Lord for the miracle. The Pharisees doesn't say, oh, thank God. You know, thank Yahweh, you know, for this healing. No, not at all. And then another one uh, is like back in John. How can a sinner do such signs? How can a sinner, referring to Jesus, healing on the Sabbath, he's a sinner because he healed on the Sabbath. How can a sinner do such signs, some miraculous signs? And you go back in John 3, chapter 2, which I'm not going to take the time now to do that. And so that's their question. How can a Sinner. So they're looking at Jesus not as the Savior, not as the anointed one, Christ the anointed one. They're looking at him as a sinner because he's healing on the Sabbath day. All their focus is skewed the wrong way. So if you go down through this in verses 17 and 18. Then the religious leaders, um, I'll read a couple more verses because it's getting late. It says, and they said to the blind man, verse 17, again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. He said, he's a prophet. In verse 18, but the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And we're going to stop with that today here, but more questioning will come upon this man. The man's had a miracle performed on him and he's going to be grilled to death by the religious leaders. They don't want to accept Christ, and so they're looking for any excuse to discredit Jesus. Okay? Now, hopefully, everyone here today has said, I believe Jesus is the Christ. I believe he died for my sins. And I received the payment he made on the cross and that I'll be part of God's forever family. Hopefully, everyone in here has done this today. But if you haven't, you have the opportunity. You know, the pastor always put that little uh, overheads up. Uh, 
concerning this that we're lost. Okay, before we come to Christ, we're actually lost. We don't know what tomorrow holds for us. I mean, we know now, if we're in Christ, that no matter what happens, we'll go to be with the Lord in heaven for all eternity. And we'll be back on the new heaven and new earth someday. But Jesus came and died for our sins. And that bridge you see on that overhead is called a pontifex. I don't know if you've ever studied this or not, what a pontifex is. A pontifex is a bridge builder. And that's who Jesus is. He's the bridge builder between man and God. He's that pontifex. So hopefully you've crossed over this bridge at some point in your life and you remember when you've done this. If not, today would be a good day to do that. All right, let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, once again, we're thankful for your word. We thank you for the story here of this account of this blind man receiving his sight. <coughs> Lord, the miracles you set forth here in John as a testament to who your son was, that it was actually God in the flesh that came to die for our sins. And Lord, I do pray for those that are here today. And I pray that each one know, knows of a time in his or her life when they've asked Jesus to come in and save them. Lord, have trusted Christ and is living for him now. Lord, today would be a great opportunity. And Lord, there may be some here that's not really not living their life as they should, that know Jesus as their Savior. And Lord, have struggles. And Lord, we just pray that they would cry for forgiveness in the quietness of their own heart. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pray that that person, he or she, would do that. Lord, that they would be able to walk in newness of life. Lord, old things will pass away and all things become new when we're in Christ. Not that, Lord, that uh, things are brand new, but the fact the way we view things now. And Lord, just help us uh, as we continue on this day. Lord, as we go through our work week and we encounter co-workers, maybe some who are outside of Christ and never trusted him. Lord, may we be the light they see from the word of God. Lord, they may not see the Bible, but they can see Christ living in our life. Help us as we go forth through our week, and we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.